Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town, which is a little bit different um, from a lot of what we usually do. But same host, I'm James Milan, um, and I am going to be talking today on the cusp of April, uh, which is a, a Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, and I am talking to Todd Paris. Todd is a boxing instructor uh, of note in the area um, who has been, in fact, working um, through a program called Rocksteady uh, with Parkinson's patients for years and years. Um, and uh, we want to hear uh, all about that experience. So that's why we're here today. Todd, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation. Thanks. Now to be, it's it's something as I mentioned to you before we went on air. It's something that I've been curious about for a long time, um, and so really glad to have this opportunity to find out more. Um, let's start with just uh, let, let me ask you. I, I mentioned you've been doing Rocksteady um, for a number of years. How long exactly, and what you know propelled you to uh, you know to to, to work with that particular population. So I've been, been doing rock steady for a little over five years. Um, I heard of it from, there was a piece on 60 minutes that my fiance had seen and found it on YouTube and showed it to me. And I'm like, this is, it just fit with kind of where I wanted to take the type of training that I do. Um, I came, it's, I came into boxing sort of accidentally. Um, I originally, like all through college, I was, uh, I did martial arts, considered myself a martial artist. Um, boxing was always of interest, but you know, just the tough guys did boxing and I wasn't a tough guy. So just, I always kind of looked at boxing and admired it from afar. Then I had cancer, uh, had a tumor in my leg, had it removed. Kicking was just kind of not going to happen for a very, very long time. And I missed, I was doing Tai Chi yoga, but I missed that thing. So I decided I'd try boxing. I'd give it a shot. And I completely fell head over heels for it. Loved every second of it. And bringing it back to the Rocksteady, all the people that I work with in Rocksteady, they have Parkinson's. Um, and we kind of, there's a, kindred spirit in that we all came to boxing never ever thinking we would come to boxing uh and just you know you get one day you get this horrible bit of news and it changes everything and so we all sort of have that uh shared experience mm -hmm. and i thought this is gonna uh, this is what i want to do this is just just i didn't know much about it but knew that's what i wanted to do so as soon as you kind of figured that out or that that hit you, I imagine you need to then undergo, I assume, some kind of training or certification or something like that to work with a particular population such as Parkinson's uh, sufferers. So what we did was it was great because um, Alice, my fiance, got me the um, the training as a Christmas gift. So I was trying to, I saw the piece and I'm like, I got to do this. And I tried signing up online, just, everything sold out, can't get in. It's like, really? So then it turned out that they got it for me. I was so excited, went to the, so the training took place in, uh, in Indianapolis. So, you know, flew out to, flew out there. It was a long weekend course. I think it was, if memory serves me correct, it was a, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it's an in-depth training where, they have, lack of a better terminology, there's like four levels for uh, Parkinson's boxers. So you start off, the class you start off learning about everything there is to know about Parkinson that you can know being a boxing trainer. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that sort of training and then you do a live session with people who are level one. So level one are folks that have Parkinson's, slight tremors, just symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily know that they had part even noted right right they then know it the training, uh, those who those who are close to them know it other people yes. they run across don't necessarily exactly so as the training goes on you work with the boxers and then you work within the classroom setting and then you work with other boxers classroom setting um and the more in-depth the training went the more 
um, the more intense the actual trainings would go. Like, I, you know, I've never had a lot of experience working with people in wheelchairs. So that was really interesting. Um, it was, you know, parts of it were terrifying, but it was really interesting at the same time. And then just th and that's sort of how that whole long weekend went. It was really, a, it was a great thing, but we, we did it face-to-face -face learning classroom style. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that when you first looked into it, uh, you know, the classes were sold out and uh, making me think, okay, there's, there's a bunch of people interested on the instructional end uh, in getting this training and, mm -hmm. and, and working with this population. Um, does that mean, you know, how many folks were there for that weekend of training in Indianapolis? We had, our group was, I'll have to find, if I can find the graduation photo, like we had a, we had a big group, all the, the rock steady groups that you, you could see if you look on their website, the rock steady boxing website. And I think they have, or their, um, Facebook page and they'll have different graduation classes. And you can mm -hmm. see in the beginning, fairly small, and then they get bigger and bigger. Then it's just like, it spills over. Um, we had, I'm terrible with numbers. I don't know exactly how many people were there, but it was a, it was a good size group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned, because uh, we should clarify that Rocksteady is a program that not only are you involved with, but as people might be able to tell since you went to Indianapolis for the training, this is a national uh, program with a lot, uh, a lot of branches all over the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, they're, 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 they're everywhere, mm -hmm. which is great. Like when I first got certified, they were in a lot of places and now they are really, they're just, they're in a, they're everywhere and it's great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, obviously, you know, those with Parkinson's are everywhere. So it's great that, uh, that these, that, that this program is finding its way kind of wending out all uh, its tentacles out all over the country to get to folks. Cause I have to imagine uh, that this is, um, you know, that, well, let me ask you rather than me imagining, I'll ask you, um, is there kind of science uh, behind the idea that boxing is particularly uh, a, a, a nice discipline or a good thing to take on uh, for many Parkinson's? Uh, many of those with Parkinson's? Yeah, that, first, it's a great question. The, the big thing that I always get asked is how does part, you know, how, how does boxing help with Parkinson's? So the way that it all began was there was a, a gentleman with Parkinson's and he, a friend of his said, you should try boxing. So he had met a trainer, a woman named Christy Rose Fulmer, who was actually a professional boxer at one point. And they, he was just doing it to get in shape. You know, he had he had Parkinson's, wanted the, some exercise. As he was doing the exercises, he started noticing some of the symptoms were going away. So his tremors got better, balance got better, just so many, he could type again. There were so many different things that started to just improve for him. So one of the things which I always, my uh, when, I, when I meet with someone new and my first, I guess my first selling point on how rock study works is what one of the things that Parkinson's does is you get a stooped and everything sort of becomes T-Rex like your arms shrink up mm -hmm. and it's just your movement just there's a shuffle and you're sort of everything is everything kind of gets contracted uh-huh with boxing so you've got someone like this boxing you want that back a little bit straightened and you want long movements you want bigger movements so the idea of going from, you know, small and tight into big motions, that is, it's a therapy that helps with the symptom of that um, balance. If you, you know, any boxing trainer will tell you they never want their fighter in a position where their fighter is going to fall down. Just it's a bad thing to happen. <laughs> with Parkinson's patients, you don't want them to fall down. So there's certain modalities of movement that we go over to help them with that. So a boxer, if they're in their stance, left foot forward, right foot back, moving to one's left, you use your forward foot. So that would be the left foot. I always tell my folks, if you're in the grocery store and you're reaching up for a, a box of cereal, you don't want to have your back foot cross behind. That's going to, that's just a recipe for falling. Right. Um, so it's, all these movements. So if you see, obviously, people in the grocery store moving around like they're fighting, 
it's probably because they took my class. And... <laughs> well, I think it, I mean, it's a, just a wonderful explanation. Um, and, and, and I'm so happy that you chose to do this interview standing up. You were saying you're, you're a fidgety person, but that does allow you to show us the movements that you're talking about yeah. and really give us a, a sense of, of what the correlation is between the things that Parkinson's, you know, those who suffer from Parkinson's are dealing with in their bodies and the things that you would naturally do as a boxing instructor and concentrate on stuff like balance, stuff like length, et cetera. Uh, that, you know, makes it very clear for me uh, how this, how there's a real symbiosis here. That mm -hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, there's also, there's, you know, there's, so those are the two basic, the real easy kind of physical parts. There's also the intangibles about fighters overcome. And it's the same thing in our rock steady boxing classes, you know, hitting a bag or shadow boxing, you get tired. And to just keep pushing through that tiredness, to overcome that obstacle helps not only with fighting or with fighters, but it also helps in your, you know, your daily, especially with Parkinson's patients, when the, you know, you, you get to a certain point during the day where the medications start to wear off and you start to slow down. And it's just the ability to fight through those moments and to get to the other side of those. So we, you know, we practice that in the gym and that way they can practice that in their home or at wherever they wind up during the day. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, showing again, not only is there kind of these are these physical uh, just kind of congruencies and, you know, things that work, uh, you know, particularly well on the physical level, but also you're saying, hey, <laughs> boxers uh, build themselves to be mentally tough as 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 much as possible. Yeah. And how can that not help anybody who's suffering from a debilitating condition? of almost any sort, but certainly for Parkinson's folks, like you said, tiring throughout the day, being able to draw on that, on that kind of, uh, that wellspring of mental fortitude that, that, you know, you build up through, through boxing and through, you know, frankly, through pain and, and overcoming, like you said, uh, again, crystal clear now that you mention it, but not necessarily uh, as obvious before we start thinking about it and talking to an expert. I'm curious, um, just to go back briefly, not to the to that training weekend itself necessarily in Indianapolis, but the, the fact that you mentioned that there were four different categories and you talked about or levels and you talked about the the most benign. Um, how you know how serious are the issues uh, uh, of the folks? And you mentioned working with people with wheelchair in wheelchairs. How serious? are the you know the physical debilities of the of those who are your most you know your your highest level uh folks that you work with they they range you know you we get folks who again for folks that you could can't really tell they have parkinson's aside from their families if you saw them in the grocery store you wouldn't know um anywhere from those to people who I, I remember I had one gentleman who was in a wheelchair when he came in. He could get out of the chair, but it was incredibly unsafe, and he would just kind of barrel around the gym. He can move by running, but he couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was dealing with, you know, someone who's wheelchair bound, which is to do a class with, you know, you can be in front of the bag and hitting. Um I'm trying to think of, of a way to kind of explain it where it's not as simple as one is kind of confined to a wheelchair. It's not like you have a broken leg or you're mm -hmm. paralyzed. It's you're able like you're able to do some things, but not other things. It's just not simple. So every I remember hearing this, it was a, always a great expression that if you dealt with someone, if you've dealt with one person with Parkinson's, you've dealt with one person with Parkinson's. <laughs> they're all so different. Right. Mm -hmm. So. That was my most extreme case. He was in the wheelchair. He could do stuff in the chair, hated being in the chair, wanted to get out, but he could only run. Mm. So it was hard working on balance, um, keeping him by the bag and making sure he was safe and that the other people around him were also safe. So things, they just, there's, there's such a wide range. Mm -hmm. 
And how how does it work? I mean, as you mentioned, working with this guy in the classroom, um, you know, or in the gym, I should say, how how does it work? Like, do you have to have um, a, you know, a, a real limit on how many people are in any class when you're working in a rock steady class? Um, do you have to also, you know, try as best you can to have people who are approximately of the same level or is there, you know, is it very, very difficult to deal with a classroom in which you've got somebody at level one and somebody at level four? Tell us, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's so what I do for, for my classes is I'll divide up level one and level two and level three and level four. So the level three and level level four are, it's a little more tricky. Um, I found in my experience, I've never had to cap the class. It's hard, it's hard to get them to want to come to the class. So there's never a lot. The level one, two, there's always a lot. It's people who either they catch it early enough um, or they just, they're of a certain age as well. Mm-hmm. And they, they want to, they, they guess they're ready to get some, to get the work on the other side. It's just, it's harder to get motivated. Mm-hmm. So the, I, I never have to worry about the class size for that. I've had experience with, so they, you know, so it's level three, four, level one, two. Me, the, meaning I, they're separate. Yes. Just, so gotcha. the three, the threes and fours are together. Right. And gotcha. ones and twos and together. Mm-hmm. I've, I've done classes where it's been everybody, you know, anyone from level one to level four. Um, what I find difficult about those, the level one folks, it's hard to see the level four folks. It's kind of hard to see, is that an inevitable future for me? Mm. And so I, I also, my thing is I, I, I don't like forcing that upon someone. You know, I know that when I was having uh, radiation therapy and I'd see the chemo patients and it's just, you know, it's not a sharks and a jets kind of thing, but you know, you just, <laughs> no, uh, you know, everyone was sort of in their own little realm and it's just, it's hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think um, addressing that quite simply um, in a lot of ways by uh, dividing one and two and three and four seems, you know, potentially very effective um, in that way, because obviously I think uh, I'm, of course, just speculating here, but uh, I would assume by the time if you do get to that, it is a progression that you one begins with the first signs and and an identification at level one. And, you know, yes, I I assume over time for most Parkinson's uh, patients that 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 they end up, you know, getting worse um in that way and um so that by the time you get to level three or four i mean you you have to <laughs> either you yeah. accept or you don't accept but it, it's not uh it's not your future it's your present and yeah. uh um and by the same token levels one and two i think you can really kind of keep them that way invigorated um and hopefully postponing or 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 yeah i mean is there Again, is, is there much evidence of that, that, you know, people who begin work uh, in boxing at level, you know, and they're level one folks that really there is there, there are definitely there are study, there are some studies and some reports I find, you know, so which, which are great. And those you can find on the Rocksteady website. They have all that sort of information. For me, it's more anecdotal where um, I had a one of my fighters, a gentleman named John. and you know, nice guy, had, had actually nice form, good, you know, but he was like in his 70s, Parkinson's, um, about a level one, one and a half. I remember a few, like after a couple of months, I was sitting at the front desk and John came up and he's like, you know, my hands don't shake as much. And I'm like, John, that's really great to hear. And he's like, yeah. And and he's just talking to me. And I'm like, you have an accent. And he's like, yeah, I was, I was, I came to this country when I was 17. I'm from Ireland. I never noticed before because I couldn't hear him because mm. it's Parkinson's has a thing where it steals your voice away. You get very breathy. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've never, I never really heard him talk. And then all of a sudden he's talking freely and it, it's just, and, and he had an accent. <laughs> so for me, it's, you know, it's, he started to get better, you know, in his world, you know, his hands weren't shaking as much. He had more energy and he just was happy. Mm-hmm. And then, 
outside looking in the whole, it was just, it really was a light bulb moment for me of like, okay, this works. Yeah. I could hear him. Um, and just that, just, you know, it was the, it was just uh, Irish accents are always great. So it was just really, really <laughs> and what a great, what a great illustration, like you said, of, of, of progress. Yeah. Um, because it was, uh, it was a, a stealth kind of thing, as you said, for him, yeah. it was all about the hands and yeah. you know, he, he could see that that's better and yeah, et cetera. But for, he, for you, you had your own independent corroboration. Things are going well, I can hear this guy. Yeah, um, that's how I, that was. A, that was that was a really good point for me because it was kind of it really just solidified. Like, okay, I'm on the right path. This is the right stuff, and this this works. Mm-hmm. What um, you know, you're you're clearly a font of um, of good stories uh, about uh, this, and you know, any number of other things. I'm sure are, are around boxing, um, but. Can you share with us, you know, maybe one or two other anecdotes that are, you know, particularly funny, particularly moving, things that just have stuck with you from uh, from working with those with Parkinson's over these last five years? It's there are, you know, it's so hard to single them out like that. That's one of my favorite stories Um, with the with the pandemic. It's been we've been removed so some of the, the memories seem fuzzy in terms of some of those face-to-face interactions. Mm. Um, currently online, it's, it's, it's been, you know, it's been fun and I miss that, that interaction with the folks. Yeah. I got to say, you know, we all, here we are, right. We're speaking to you in a way that we wouldn't usually, if we, if we had alternatives mm. and that we wouldn't, you know, we would have come to your gym and, uh, you know, been right in that space. And uh, so we're all good and tired of this world, as we know. Um, but I have to imagine that particularly dealing in the field that you do, something so visceral and physical and, and right, you know, where you need to be reading the cues right there in front of you, um, and then that particular population. Mm-hmm. I, I can't even imagine trying to migrate that over to the virtual world it must have it must be you said it's fun i'm sure you've had a positive attitude it's, about it it's challenging it's challenging got to be challenging yeah um so yeah i, I it, you know what i'm sure you're keeping a lot of tabs on on this any idea what the prospects are for when you're going to be able to return to real world uh, so what we, we we were we were sort of back at the gym a few months ago before the second sort of shutdown. The plan right now is to go back on April 6th, but there's not a lot of folks that want to go back. So there's maybe about three people that want to go back to the gym and hit bags. Everybody else likes doing the zoom sessions, wants to stay at home, which I totally get. Uh, I I don't know how much of that will change now that everyone's getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're you know they're all bragging about their shots and uh which is gets get, quite annoying um <laughs> but the but everybody you know the the three people that are really looking what I, what i do is i'll do the zoom session from the gym have the guys in the gym have the folks at home so i'm, I'm able to, to it's it's i can do it anywhere mm-hmm. um so but it looks like april 6 we'll start going back and every, everyone is welcome to come back that wants to come back and for you, Todd, personally, I, I assume that you um, that this is part of your your you know professional and maybe even personal life at this point. Um, you clearly are um, completely engaged and thoroughly committed, and uh, seem, sounds like devoted to those who you're working with. Um, do you see this being something, I mean, you're five years into it now, is this something that you're going to be doing as long as you are coaching boxing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, it's, it's, I, I just, I love it. You know, I, I fell head over heels in love with boxing when I, when I went to boxing, when I started to teach or coach, it was just, you know, the, the next evolution of my love affair. Um, this has been just another, another piece of it you know it's 
I'm, I'm trying to think of something in a romantic sense when, you know, you're that special someone you realize, wow, she, has, she can sing. She has a beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. And it's just something else you love about them. So for me, with boxing, this is just another element of this great sport and movement that I fell in love with. It's another thing to yet hold on to and love. And I'm incredibly lucky that this will be something that I can do, you know, up until I'm in my 80s, teaching and helping folks with Parkinson's fight Parkinson's. Um, and I, so I, I see this as just something I, I will always, always do and be a part of. Well, I am so glad, really. Uh, I was looking forward uh, to this interview, and um, it has <laughs> it has been all that I, I hope. Oh, good. And, and more, really. Wonderful insight um, and great way to explain uh, a lot of what is going on in the world of Rocksteady. Um, I wish you, um, you know, I hope that your grand love affair with boxing uh continues and you. you know develops even more of those kind of endearing elements to it as rocksteady is um and obviously you're doing great good for a number of people who deserve it and um you know just carry on thank uh, you again here on the cusp of of april where people will hopefully be thinking a little bit more about this issue um and informing themselves um, I think we've just created a, another piece uh, for people to tune into um, and really get some some better understanding of uh, of what these folks are up against and also what they've got going for them with people like you. Thank you so much. Oh, th again, thank you. We have been speaking um, with Todd Paris, who is a boxing instructor for a number of years, but for the last five and way into the future, uh, working with uh, those with Parkinson's through the program Rocksteady and clearly uh, to, great, um, to great advantage and benefit uh, for those involved, including Todd himself. Um, this is James Milan. You've been watching Talk of the Town. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.